we see things in life that we think are real. And I love saying this, and sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. But moreover, what is very real is that we can do things that help ourselves, help the planet out, help others out, and actually create businesses or environments where people are extremely happy, where they don't want to leave. How often do people say, okay, got to go to work. When they're done with work, oh, got to go home. It's all done. At John Paul Mitchell Systems, the first major company I started, our turnover in 38 years, we're 38 years old. We started in 1980 with $700, and we're 38 years old. We're in 101 countries throughout the world. Our turnover in 38 years is less than 100 people. Yeah, they don't want to leave. Now, why? And, and I think one of the reasons that I'm here is to let people know what was done to make people love what they do so much. They want to stay, they want to spread it out to others, and they want to be part of something that's changing this planet. A great example of this is, well, how do you uh, reprimand somebody, whether it's in your personal life, whether it's a disagreement, how do you reprimand somebody, and then all of a sudden they love you afterwards? How do you do that? How do you do that in business where there's something wrong and it's all corrected? I think I could go a little bit more to present time in the last 15 years, and then I'll go back to the beginning. But we have something called Paul Mitchell schools throughout the United States. We have about 120 of them, Paul Mitchell, the school. And it's a great beauty school. You could go there and learn how to be a great hair cutter, a great hair stylist, a great hair colorist, uh, learn how to merchandise, how to market, how to run a salon, even teach you business there. But we do something that nobody else does. And we hope it's going to spread throughout the world. It's about a one-year curriculum full-time to be a great hair stylist and get licensed. But part of your curriculum is giving back. It's part of your curriculum. We take the time to teach our people in school, the younger ones. Once we had a student who uh, was a grandmother, 64 years old, always wanted to be a hairdresser and enroll in the school. But their part of their curriculum is, one, how to love yourself and love others. All too often with today's generation, whether it's the earrings in the ears, the nose, the crazy hair, whatever, the parents don't connect. Or they don't connect together. Well, how, how do you reconnect people who aren't connecting? How do you give them the opportunity to be able to reconnect? Friends of yours, how do you reconnect? How do you love them again? People had some of your best friends at one time and something went wrong. You don't know what happened. We teach them things so simple that they could apply to their personal life or apply to their business life. For example, if somebody does something wrong, they usually defend themselves. They don't say, okay, I screwed up. They usually defend themselves. Well, I'll give you an example here of how something goes wrong and then how to make it right. Make it right by you being wrong and them being right. For example, maybe you had somebody in high school that was your best friend. Somebody told you something they said, and you thought they said or did, and all of a sudden, you shied away from them. They weren't your friend anymore. Well, if you went up to them and said, even today, hey, what did you do? You know, you really, I, I, you really upset me in a big, big way. I heard you did this and that. The first thing they'll do is get defensive. So how do you reconnect? You pick up the phone, or you see them in person, or today you text or email, and you be the big one and say, Dear Charlie, dear Mary, you know, I was just thinking, in high school, we were the best of friends, but in the second part of the 12th grade, for example, something went wrong. I don't know what I did wrong, not them, what I did wrong to cause that, but I want you to know that today I'm a different person. They probably are a different person today. All of a sudden, the person now starts talking to them. Oh, well, I don't know what you did wrong. Well, I don't know what I did either. Please tell me, I wanna be your friend. In 80% or more of all cases, all of a sudden, they're now communicating with one another. Now, I did this once at Paul Mitchell when I had a distributor in New York City that didn't like Vinny, my regional manager there. This is about maybe 20 years ago. She said, JP, I don't want Vinny here anymore. We don't get along. I don't like his attitude. Please give me another regional. Well, it happened at a time where I had an opening in New Jersey, no problem, give you somebody new. 
As the years went by, I kept on thinking, something went wrong here, and let's try this on them. So Vinny called Diane upon the phone and said, Diane, hi, it's Vinny. Diane, just please give me a moment. Diane, we got along so well, and I know I really screwed up on something. I'm not quite sure of what it was, but I know I really get goofed up. I meant, well, please help me in life. I'm a different person now. Yes, it's been like, you know, 10, 15 years, but I appreciate you. Please tell me I'm wrong so I can be a better person. As Vinny tells me and Diane tells me, within five minutes, they're crying on the phone to each other, loving each other. Vinny came back as a regional. She demanded it. And when I tried to move him again, she wouldn't let it do it. <laughs> Communications and love in business. When you start a company like John Paul Mitchell Systems and you only have $700, boy, you gotta have a lot of love out there for people to listen to you walking around selling your product. And we didn't have enough money to hire anybody for six months. Didn't have any money. It was Paul and I. We looked like we were bigger, but we weren't. It was day to day. In fact, uh, it was about two years before we actually paid our bills on time. So Shirley Wong was our first employee. Shirley, we need help. Shirley, I'm doing 20 jobs. I need you to do 10. And the jobs will be, you're the, you answer the phone instead of my answering machine, you're the bookkeeper, you're the shepherd. I mean, you're 10 different things here. Shirley, love you, dear. Please help, we need your help. Shirley needed a job, we couldn't pay her a lot, but she went for it. And I made it a point, whenever I found anything that she did that was halfway correct, to tell her, Shirley, you did this. And you did it on your own, and it was really, really good. And that's not your space. That's not your space. But you did it good. Thank you for seeing something other than what you're supposed to do, and you did it. God bless you, Shirley, you know. Really love you. And that's how we started growing our company. Now, as we grew, there were other things for love, for animals, as well as the humans, and as well as the planet. I used to work for Redken Laboratories as a manager of two of their divisions. And at their headquarters in Van Nuys, California, one day I was walking down the hallway and here's this little room with a window about so big. So I opened the door and stuck my head in and here's all these little cages with little monkeys. They were called marmosets. How cute. They were experimenting on them. So I said, well, for starters, when do they go for a walk? I'd like to see them outside. And the head of research said, oh, no, 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 they never leave the room. I said, but they can't even see outside. There's this little window. And if they jumped out, which they couldn't even reach, they hit the top of the, the, the little cage you're in, they're going to see a wall outside. How about I come by, I'll bring a leash, I'll take each one for a walk after hours. JP, you can't do that. Well, why are we testing on animals? The answer was because it makes us look good. But we make products for humans, not for animals. Yeah, but it makes us look good. When John Paul Mitchell Systems was started, that never left my mind, the love for animals. And anywhere around me, we found that they love animals too. John Paul Mitchell Systems was the first company in the world in the professional beauty industry to say, even though we're little, we have no money, we will not only not test on animals, we will not buy any ingredients from anybody that does. And we made the statement, we were attacked. We were attacked. I want to tell you about times do change with people, they really do. We were attacked. My competitors, Sebastian, Matrix, they attacked us in writing. These guys are going nowhere. They're dangerous products. They won't test on animals. In fact, we actually printed on our bottles as little money as we could afford for black and white. Not tested on animals, tested by hairstylists. <laughs> 10 years later, they followed suit. Many of them said we're not testing on animals anymore. Some of them had their vendors do it, but eventually I think they kind of caught on. So sometimes when we pass love in business, it spreads it so far that others will pass it along too to our animal friends throughout the world. We're the same thing with trees. Now, as we build businesses, what are some of these secrets of showing people love and dignity where they love it and their job becomes a way of life. I'm mainly in Austin, Texas, but I'm in California every couple of weeks. And, oh, God, a couple of years ago, I don't normally work really late in my office, but I did this day. And we normally close up at 4.30 in the afternoon. And our people around the office, so I went out there and said, what are you still doing here? I'm here, because I rarely ever am here, but I'm here, I have some things to do, catch up. And why aren't you going home? No, no, JP, we have stuff to do. How many of you are here? 12. 
come into my office. They all came in my office. Of course, they poured him shots of Patron. Anyways, <laughs> they all came to the office. And I said, guys, why are you here? The answer was, because we love what we do. That's why we heard JP. We just love it. In other words, it's a way of life that they've incorporated what we do with them as their way of life, their lifestyle. So good they don't want to leave. Now, when somebody goofs up and people goof up, okay, how do you, in a nice way with a staff member, or maybe someone in your family, maybe one of your kids, how do you reprimand them with love? You need three things. And if any of you could write this down, please do. They're very simple. It's all about love here. Number one is to tell them what they did incorrectly, because they may not know. Number two is how to do it right. And number three is the biggie, what they do right anyways. You have that ready in your hands before you call them in. Put a little asterisk next to this one. Whenever you reprimand somebody, do it behind closed doors, one-on-one, -on -one, and nobody around. Reprimand in private, one-on-one, -on -one, with nobody around. The minute you reprimand somebody or tell them off in public or someone else can hear, oh my God, you just created covert hostility and everything else in most people. People don't forget that. If you're big enough, have enough love, you will. You'll understand why sometimes this happens. But boy, don't ever do that. Reprimand them in private, behind closed doors, nobody could hear. Here's where the three come in. The first thing you want to tell me, you're ready for this, is what is it they did wrong? Instead of saying, hey, you screwed up, here's what you did wrong, it'd be like, for example, you know, when you answer the phone, if you answer it with a smile, People at the other end know somebody's happy there, and it makes them feel better, more relaxed talking to you. And you know, I, I know you probably do that a lot, but you don't do it all the time. We would love to do that all the time when you're answering the phone, no matter where you are, whether you're the receptionist, whether someone's giving you a call, like, hi, hi, how can I be of service to you? Smile, it's wonderful. So I told them what they did wrong and why we do it right. Here's why we do it that way, and here's how we do it. You are so good at what you do. You come in on time, you just make everybody happy, you get your stuff down, and by God, you're in our creative department. I love the work you do. Someone as great as you, I think automatically should be given that extra smile to everybody else, don't you? The person's been reprimanded, they've been told how to do it right, and before they leave, they know that you love them and appreciate them for what they do and what they do right. Now they walk out happy. Another little trick I'll also give you in business before I get into how to praise people is a piece of paper once. Very difficult to do. In fact, uh, when I train, I've trained, no, I trained the CIA, it's no secret, and I trained them in management motivation. I'm the FBI and others. And at the CIA I said, I want to teach you guys all how to handle a piece of paper once so you don't have your desk full of stuff. And uh, Buzzy Cronkart, the executive director said, JP, this is the CIA. If we handle a piece of paper 100 times, that's good for us, man. We handle these papers thousands of times. He said, we'll see what we could do, though. When you're at your desk or wherever you are and you get mail, have a trash can here, telephone here, something to write with. You open up something. If it's junk, get rid of it. Should be shredded, shred it. If you need to make a phone call and you've got the time, before you take up the next piece of paper, make that phone call. When you're done, throw the piece of paper away. If it's something that needs somebody else to do, write on there, so-and-so, please handle, thank you, love, peace, love, and happiness, JP. It immediately goes in a pile to somebody else. If it's something you have to really think about or you've got to write another letter to and your assistant isn't there, then you put it in a little stack for immediate letters. In other words, when you get something, you try and handle it one time. Make a phone call, handle it, throw it away, give it to somebody else. If it's something important you've got to file, that one little teeny stack, you file. Now when you're done with that, any phone call you couldn't make right then, get them out of the way first if you can, depending on what country you're calling. Uh, try and get those business calls all the way as soon as you can. The other little stack you have to send a letter to, either start writing that letter. And what I've done lately, and it works really good, by the way, I don't do email. I'd be inundated, fully inundated, so I don't do email. But what I found myself doing is, when I get a letter from somebody, I pick up the pen and I write the answer on the letter they sent me. Or if I want to acknowledge them, I'll write 
thank you so much. I appreciate your kindness. Then I make my peace, love, and happiness sign, JP. Then all my assistant has to do is either fax it to him or email to him. It's done. It's out of the way. And I'm acknowledging people. If people ask me a question and I could answer in just like a short sentence, I'll write right on there. I'll initial it and, and hand it to them and let them go on with it. It makes things much smoother, and it's with love. And people see something handwritten. Whoa, people don't do that these days. A handwritten little message. Another thing I found also is I get hit up a lot, a whole lot, more than I could ever handle for charities, for mentoring, and everything else. People I've never heard of in my life. I get so much of this, I can't really handle it all, okay? If there's something that I can handle a little bit, I'll pass it on to one of my assistants to do. But what I normally will do, if I've never heard from these people before and there's no time to acknowledge them, I don't make the phone call and say, thank you very much, uh, not this year, maybe in the future, because they will call you back in the future and ask you again. I found it best, and it's not root, throw it away and don't answer it. Because especially if you're in a date the way I am. If something that is interesting to you, give to one of your charities, one of your friends, or make the call on your own. So you keep things moving. You cannot, you cannot, and God knows, you know, <laughs> I've tried. You cannot be the answer to everybody and everything. I try and solve every problem, do everything in knowledge, and I suck at it. I can't handle it all. I could only do so much, and the so much I do is like that. So I'm trying to go down a little bit, you know? Now, do I have challenges in my life? You better believe it. I have some pretty many challenges in my life. But in most times, I try and see the positive side of it. A lot of people say, well, JP, you're just too positive. Something lousy happens, and, you know, you, you try and see the positive side, and you don't really let it get to you in 99% of most cases. You know, but sometimes with love, it does get to you, and, you know, it fries you. But sometimes... It, it, it's, it's just there. And why do I say this? And we're going to go into how to praise people. Why do I say this? Every one of you, every one of us, we're all dying right now. We're all dying. If I were to say to you, hey, you know, uh, what, you're going to be dead in two weeks. What would you like to do in the next two weeks? We're all dying. So start doing it now. We're going to die. Some of you in 100 years, some of you in 150 years, some of you in 10 years. Try and do it now. How do we praise people? And that's part of the biggest part of love. Whenever you praise somebody, whether it's your own family, your friends, or in business, and you want to praise somebody, praise them openly and loudly and in front of no less than one person. You want them to shine, so it's like, Oh my gosh, you're answering the phone so great. You're the division manager of our entire advertising department. When some, It's like, wow, you're great. I make sure when I tell you that, there's one or two people somewhere listening, even if it's the main office, and I could talk loudly. I really can't, okay? Or I make sure that happens. So the person not only feels your love and your acknowledgement, but they know that you're telling others around you, them, and around you how great they are. Back at the Paul Mitchell schools where we started, we spend a month. What do our students do? They each have a program with their school to be philanthropic and learn how to give back. Now, how do they do this? They have cut-a-thons. They have car washes. They are so innovative. We underwrite the whole thing. Everything it costs our schools to do this, we pay for it all. Even have a giant banquet at the very end for our schools, we pay for it all. Every penny that our students raise, 50% stays in their community, and they pick out where they, it should go. The other 50% we help with, whether it's Children's Miracle Network, where all these kids, for example, that can't afford medical care, get free medical care through Children's Miracle Network. Uh, we have a program going on in Africa. Where, uh, we take care of about 8,000 kids. All of them are one day old to 12 years old. It's called Food for Africa. Every one of their parents have died of AIDS. They're the ones nobody wants. We give them shelter. There's 17,000 in the program. We do about seven or 8,000 every year. We give them food, shelter, and education, and protection. So they have a good chance in life. So they know that they're now taking care of things in different parts of the world. They'll never meet these people. Why do we want our students to know that we are giving money to Children's Miracle Network, 
We're giving him to Food for Africa, to Sea Shepherd, to all kinds of great things. Why do we want him to know it? They will never ever meet the majority of all these people. Some of them will never meet any of them. Some of them get pretty excited and save money and go to Africa, go to our uh, Grow Appalachian, the Appalachian Mounds we started, go to Chrysalis, our, our centers for homeless that we're getting back. Some will go there and participate. But what we teach them is this. Why do we do this? Because the love of doing something for somebody else and asking absolutely nothing in return is the greatest high you will ever get. When you could do something for somebody else and ask nothing in return, it's one of the greatest highs you'll ever get. And the kids learn that. They learn how to talk to people, how to when they're in, in the school. Pe like Agape walked into our office last week and said, were you guys ready for me? What are you talking about? Why are you guys so happy? We always are. We spread the love by taking care of things. Patron. We started Patron with love. Started Patron in 1989 with my buddy Martin Crowley. We wanted a tequila that was the finest tequila ever that you could actually sip and not get a hangover the next day. We found the finest agave. We found the finest way to do it. And we found this guy named Francisco Alcarez who was the chef of tequilas. And he got this formula that we found with another company in Mexico and he said, I can make it better and smoother and he did. We went to the tequila business. Several years ago, at a press conference, somebody asked Francisco Alcarez, Francisco, what is the signature Patron? Everyone's trying to knock it off. There's 200 tequilas out there, but Patron's the biggest in the world. What's the secret? He says, the secret of Patron is love. We love what we do, who we do it for, and how we treat it. At Patron, I can remember the days when I had one dollar. Doesn't buy you much for lunch. Well, at Paul Mitchell, as soon as I could afford it, everyone got free lunch. Whatever you want. At first it was you got a $10 limit because that's all we could afford. But Paul Mitchell today, you go in there, free lunch. You're a guest, free lunch. You order off menus and the menus change. Two or three rests, all free lunch. At Patron, if you work for us during the day, there's 1,500 people, by the way, there, you get free lunch made by chefs. You work for us on the night shift, chefs make you dinner. You want to pray? We built a chapel in the middle of the Patron facility. Go and pray whenever you want. We love you. We want you to be wonderful. What's your challenges? You need a new school. We'll build it for you. Some of the older people have no more family left. Something happened to them. Who knows? We'll help them out. We do it with love. If a manager ever talks rudely to one of our people, we give them one warning in a nice way. Same way I told you. Here's what you did wrong. Here's how we do it right. You know, you do everything else right. You're a great manager. If they do it a second time, we send them to school for a few days. Anger management, how to deal with people, okay? To help them out. They do it a third time, they're gone. There's no ifs, buts, and maybes. And I've replaced some pretty heavy duty management because they didn't love our people. It works so effectively, our people will find me from Mexico, anywhere in the world, and write me a letter or the president of Patron a letter telling us if something isn't full of love in our companies. We breed and we have that love. End result is, my God, look what happens. I want to share with you, because a few people said, yay, when the Chief Shepherd came up here. How philanthropy and what we do to save animals also helps mankind out. We had this terrible, terrible hurricane come right through Barbuda. Terrible hurricane through Barbuda. Wiped out the whole city there. I got a hold of Sea Shepherd. I had bought him a short time ago a Coast Guard cutter. They wanted a fast ship to chase down the Japanese that were killing the wells or the people that were taking the sharks and cutting off their fins and throwing them back in the water and just keeping the fin for shark fin soup, right? That's what we do. We save, uh, I was on the ship with them, saving the baby harp seals up in Alaska, okay? I mean, in, in, uh, in Canada. It was, we do this stuff, right? All of a sudden, no one's there. The boats are wiped out. It happened to be in Miami, this particular boat that I got them very fast. I picked up the phone, I called Paul Watson and far up, and I said, if the boat's free, I want to fill it with gas, they need help in Barbuda and all those islands. In two seconds, no problem, 
the crew got together, filled with gas, and went straight on down there. When they went down there, they brought with them supplies they needed. They brought with them the head of the World Relief Organization. Now, they had a way to get there. And everything they needed. And once it was there for several days a week, the prime minister says, this is perfect. We're not ready yet to move too many people back to Barbuda, but up there in Tobago, up there in uh, St. Bart's, they really need some help up there. C. Separate said, no problem immediately went up there and helped out the people. So when we go there to help out nature, to help out animals, these same groups are there to help out everything on the planet. There's so many ways to show our love, and at the same time, those that we show love for can do the same thing. My God, I'll tell you, we make sure those people on the Sea Shepherd, all volunteers, all volunteers. They don't get paid. They come on this to to pay. We make sure they have the best hair care products. We make sure whatever you can imagine, they have it there. It's a way of showing love. And we don't do it enough. You know, and maybe some of us have the ability to maybe even love and express it without complications more than others. Some of us don't. Some of us take a little while longer. But all in all, it works. I know time-wise you want to stay on time, and I only have about 10 minutes left. And I want to take that time. I could talk to you for three hours all day, actually. But let me take that last 10 minutes. For any questions you may have regarding business, regarding anything, please. Anything you may want to ask me, if you have any questions, please ask. In business and in your corporations, how have you dealt with when there has been dishonesty or embezzlement in your companies? That is an excellent thing to ask. Dishonesty and embezzlement. It's happened to me twice. Once by someone I thought was my real good buddy. And by another, by a guy put in charge of one of my other companies, not Paul Mitchell or Patron. The minute I find, found it, they were fired. When recently I found it on a big scale, they are fired and they went to jail. And the reason I not only fired them, I went to jail, was they were one of the nicest people could ever imagine. But they were pulling this money out over a period of time. And then I realized other people several years ago, because I, I knew this person for years, said, you know, I never knew whatever happened to that money I sent this person. It all came together. If you let people go that have a track record or did something really bad, they're going to do it again because they got away with it. And, oh, JP, what's the worst? JP's going to catch me. Somehow i got to pay it back. you got to stop them. So if you find that, stop them and put them in jail. Thank All right? You, you know, you, you have to. If not, it's going to continue on. It's a bad, bad uh, lesson for someone else to learn. Thank okay. you. Thank you. The other young lady there. What is your hiring process like in terms of interview? Do you do any interesting types of questions to vet the best people? Very good. What is my hiring process as far as interviews go? I try and hire not from the piece of paper I'm looking at, but from the heart. When they come in, and, and I don't do a lot of the hiring now, but when I do do the hiring, or I did before, I sit down with them, I just feel them. When you see a resume, your resumes are cool, but you know, you could you know, fabricate one a little bit. When someone tells you how great they are, what they're doing, yeah, that's cool, but you know, they're on their best behavior. But if you sit back and feel the heart a little bit, and then see, are they enthusiastic? Are they happy for it? What do you feel about them? That's not easy to do. If you feel good about them, and if they're qualified, by gosh, hire them. But here's another thing I want to tell you. If you hire them, don't defend your mistake if you made one. You could never, ever in your life ever be faulted for somebody you hire. You didn't know. It's happened to me before, okay? You don't know. But you could be faulted for somebody you did not fire. Because if you don't fire them or in a nice way let them go, they're going to be doing something they're not meant to do, and it keeps them away from finding their glory. There was a time in my life, and by the way, it's in the film Good Fortune, where I was fired by three companies. All after, why? I did a great job. My sales were up. Everything was wonderful. We are not our type of manager, JP, right? How did this happen? Well, go forward now, 10 years. I start John Paul Mitchell Sisters with no money. A couple years into it, I realized, wow. If you could open up to a higher source, the universe, and some people hate me saying this, but the universe, eventually it teaches you something. I was, why did they fire me? I did good. Why did they fire me? I did good. Why did they fire me? I did good. Start John Paul Mitchell Systems with 700 bucks. A couple years later, all of a sudden it came to me. Oh my God, there's a powerful force. We're here for different reasons. And if we're delayed along the way or upset along the way, there's some reason for it. If I did not work for Fermido, Try, and Redkin All, I learned something out of each one of them. 
I could have never started John Paul Mitchell Systems, let alone with $700 and never borrowed a penny, had I not learned something from every single one. Something pushed me out. That wasn't my destiny. My destiny eventually what happened to be in the same industry on a higher scale, but maybe there were things for me to learn in different places, and then it comes together. So open up to fate. If ever you get fired, something went wrong for you, hey, maybe it's gonna turn around somewhere and either that person or you or whatever is gonna learn a little bit more where now it's really ready and just really, really good. Hope that answers. Another question? I'll start right over here. What is the largest uh, business failure you've had and what did you learn from it? Largest business failure that I've ever had? <laughs> no, I've had a few. I've had a few. Oh, I would say, yeah, well, this one particular fellow that I was in business with and hydrocarbons and many, many other things. I really trust this guy. Never checked the books, never checked his character or anything, and found out over a period of time the guy was stealing from me, and half the stuff he said were lies, flat out lies. The lesson to learn is start checking things out a little bit more and don't leave everybody, no matter how joyful and what a great personality they have. Check it out. That was a good lesson to be learned. And I'm not really good at it, but I'm much better than before. This young lady and then the gentleman back there. Hi, yes, ma'am. Thanks for being here. I'm Jamie. Quick question is, at this level, how do you define success? That's the best question. At this level, how do you define success? Success is not what position you rose to. Success is not how much money you have. Success is how well you do what you do. In high school, I was the greatest, most successful janitor in the world at Stewart's Cleaners. I would move stuff and clean behind it, and nobody was around watching me. One day, Stewart, who was the tightest, cheapest guy in the world, I worked for a buck and a quarter an hour, dollar and a quarter, right? Came to me and said, Johnny, I gotta talk to you. I go, oh no, I really needed my job. I always worked my whole life, and, and I'm in high school, right? He says, Johnny, I gotta talk to you. Last night, I went up to the little mezzanine, laid in my cot to rest, took my watch off, put it on the table, it fell on the floor. So I went down to pick it up, I noticed under the cot there was no dust. These are the old cots, metal, springs, little thing on top. He said he moved it, no dust. Look behind the, the cabinet, no dust. You clean this place as if I were on top of you wash every moment. I said, well, Mr. Stewart, I, I really like my job, sir, and, you know, I want to keep my job, I like it, and I'm going to do the best I can whether you're around or not. He said, Johnny, here's a quarter raise. I made a buck fifty an hour. Now, where I went to high school, that was, I was probably the highest paid kid in high school for anyone that had a job where I went to high school. Success is how well you do what you do, not your position or your money. There was a, a gentleman, yes, or lady back there. What are your thoughts on manufacturing in the U.S. versus overseas? Boy, did you ask the right question. What are your thoughts to manufacturing in the U.S. opposed to elsewhere? John Paul Mitchell Systems, every one of my liquid products are all made in the United States of America. And I want to tell you my feeling on why. Do I have enough time to, like, three more minutes? Are we cool on time? You have nine more minutes. Oh, great. Wow. Okay. Wow. The timer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. No, this is great. All right. I make it here in the United States. Maybe it cost me one or one percent. Well, now it cost me only one percent more because I learned how to make everybody more efficient. Okay, now, why the United States? If I make it the United States, the people who are in the labs that are making it have a job. They can now buy stuff from the grocery store and everybody else. Who's gonna be buying Paul Mitchell? Some of them, okay? So by keeping it here, I'm creating jobs. By wanting to keep it here, I learned how to be more efficient. Like how to take two people to do the job of one and they love it, they become more efficient. So all of a sudden, instead of a 10% difference, it's down to a 1% difference. Now I don't do this on hard tools because they don't make them the same way like special blow dryers and all that. That is, actually goes to a couple different countries. But the bulk of Paul Mitchell hair care products are made in the United States of America, proudly made in the United States of America. We create more jobs, it creates more, and for that extra 1%, it's no big deal, it's just 1% more. And that 1% more though is helping me in five years, 10 years, maybe three years, have more customers because more jobs were created. With Patron, I have to make Patron in Mexico. In El you have to, it's a law, okay? We make it there the finest of everything. So that's, however, my corporate headquarters for the world are not in the US, they're in Switzerland for the world because we're globally based. Paul Mitchell is in the United States, not in any other country. And by the way, Paul Mitchell, I could have moved it so easy from LA 
to Las Vegas, Nevada, and knock out that California tax, which is very, very high. But the majority of people that worked in my warehouse lived in downtown LA and Pacoima, and they're, a lot of them are Hispanic, they're big families. I'd have to move them someplace where their families weren't. It wasn't worth it, not for my people. It's a way of showing love and keeping things here. Hope that answered it. Yes? What encouragement could you give those of us who have been leading with love as a part of our business plan and as part of our format for many years in survival? Great, perfect question. You already got the love part, and most of you here know a lot more about love than me, okay, and express it better, so we don't have to touch that part. But that other part I could touch with you very well. Two things. Number one, be prepared for a lot of rejection. If you are prepared for a lot of rejection and you know it's coming, it's not gonna bug you that much. I learned that selling books door to door, Collier's Encyclopedia, no appointments. You'd have doors slammed in your face. The lifespan of an encyclopedia salesman back when I was selling them, they don't, they're not around anymore, was three days. I lasted three and a half years. But I remember I was just a kid. They said, now people are gonna close doors in your face, but keep the same enthusiasm. Make sure you're just as excited on door number 20 or 50 as you were on door number one when they closed it in your face. I believed them. How's it going? Okay, no problem. On door number 103, hi, how are you? It took quite a while to get in, but I was prepared for rejection. Most people aren't prepared. If it happens, it hits you in your heart. Oh no, I'm not good enough. Oh no, uh, I'll never succeed. Someone said this, it's not working out for me. Be prepared for rejection. If you're prepared for rejection, when it hits you, it's not gonna totally turn you off and you go on. The second thing is, and very important, you do not want to be in the selling business. Any of you that have businesses right now, you don't wanna be in the selling business you want to be in the reorder business. Now, what do I mean by that? Your service or your product is so good that when somebody uses it, they want to reorder it. When someone uses your service, they want to re reuse it. If it's a one-time deal, they only buy it one time, they want to tell friends how good it is. So yes, you've got to sell your product, but your mentality should be, whatever I have is so good that I'm gonna be in the reorder business. They're gonna to wanna to reorder it or tell somebody about it. That's my goal, not just with a quick sale. Thank you, peace, love, and happiness, and love you.